Could have, you, you marry, mothers. Nobody will dispute that. Who prevents you from marrying? What you're asking for is not that, mothers. They are married. The problem is not that, mothers. You can call it by any name, which is why, mothers, it's really not necessary for your lordships to say marriage is part of 21 or 14. Marriage is, an marriage is a union of people. It's inalienable. I have a right to be together with anybody I want, maybe same sex, maybe heterosexual, maybe anything. This is the problem. It is the recognition which matters. It's not the, the union which, which is a given. Five Supreme Court judges are being asked to close the debate in Parliament and in the public space through a declaration that same-sex marriages must be accorded the same status as heterosexual marriages. In minorities... Supreme Court judges, the Supreme Court. When I say five Supreme Court, it's the Supreme Court, Mother. Yes. <laughs> when it is five just So we're just judges. sort of clarifying that. No, <laughs> no, no, no Mother, of course. Even in a judgment Without. of seven to six, well, the decision it's of three 13, to two, Mother. Not a judgment of seven. Obersfeld was five to four, it was the US Supreme Court, Mother. I, I, I know that, I know that. When I said Mother's five, I meant Mother's numerically. Yes. <laughs> Minorities of all hues, like minority opinions, are protected from institutional discrimination, but they cannot demand as of right that they be accorded a status that should only be restored through legislation. The ma that marriage is a heterosexual union granted societal approbation over centuries. It is not a historical coincidence. The premises that support the institution of heterosexual unions is a sociological phenomena which has endured for thousands of years. The essence of the petitioner's claim now is that the state must change its definition of marriage. This is the issue. History teaches us that when a paradigm shift of the law is at stake, the judgment of the court reflects its wisdom and restraint, which is predicated upon its understanding of the consequences of such a paradigm shift. In essence, liberty means freedom from executive intrusion into spaces protected by the Constitution and not entitlement to government benefits. This is the perspective with which, Malad, I request your Lordships to look at this issue. Then, Malad, I, the quick summary of arguments, the Special Marriage Act of 54, is not violative of 14, 15, 19, 21 by virtue of being limited to heterosexual couples, as under 14 and 15, opposite sex marriages and same sex marriages represent two different classes. This is based on historical evolution of marriage as a social institution and unique dynamics between the partners. The act is therefore not in violation of 14 and 15. Under 21, there may exist a right to choose one's partner as a function of privacy and dignity. Hence, members of the LGBTQIA plus community are at liberty to choose their partners as per the customs and usages as evolved, if any. However, there is no fundamental right to the legal recognition of such unions by the legislature. As of now, the only recognition that is available in law is in respect of unions between man and woman. The act is therefore not in violation of 21. Refer to Puttu Swami, the passages, Malaz, I don't have to, your lordships are already aware. Then, Malaz, I am very strongly opposed to this reliance on foreign judgments, quite frankly. Foreign judgments where same-sex marriages are delivered in the context of the socio-cultural environment of the relevant country and in specific factual contexts. Therefore, they cannot influence the decision-making process in India. However, they provide valuable examples of the following. One, the necessity of public discourse and engagement with the issue of same-sex marriages. And two, incremental changes in law and policy on same-sex marriages and concomitant rights. Well, as I've given, Gaidan refers to it. And then, well, it's uh, Minister of Home Affairs, Fori, and... Um, the Constitutional Court of... In all cases, mothers, there has been huge public discourse. Huge. And there are paragraphs after paragraphs that refer to it, mothers.
The legal recognition of same-sex marriages is a matter of, for Parliament to reflect and act upon. The LGBTQIA plus community may be declared as a sexual minority, just as transgender community is recognized for their separate gender identity. This is another aspect that your lawyers may explore. It's yes. akin to minorities, which must be in a secular constitution, must be given protection. So there are two pronged Mullard's declarations that your lawyers can think of. One, their separate sexual identity, and as a sexual minority, protection of the state. <coughs> well, they are also a sexual minority, mm -hmm. and minorities in a secular state need to be protected. So the protection in a secular state available to minorities generally should also be available to sexual minorities. Minority Persecution. A, I would put it in a wider perspective. Minority in a democracy. Every minority in a democracy. Yes, yes, I, I agree, Mother. I agree. Yes. When I said when secular... You need not... You All right. Hear, there are minorities which are not received. That is a certain connotation. I understand. I, I, I appreciate discrete that. Discrete minority, yeah, yeah. minority concept. I, I agree, Mother. I was only thinking in the other context. Yes, I agree. Broadly. Broadly. So this, these are two areas your lawyers can think of, Mother. Taking it forward. Now, Malaj, let's come to the. Then, Malaj, the text, purpose, and intention of SMA only contemplates to deal with heterosexual marriages. The court cannot interpret the enactment and declare that the SMA covers same sex marriages through any process, according to me, misinterpretation. I've written the word interpretation word, recognized by law. It would be completely misinterpreting the statute. In fact, Malaj, one of the questions, and I don't want to waste your lordship's time, was asked. When you refer to person in 4.1, what does it mean? Well, when you refer to person in 4.1, at that time they are unmarried. So you can't refer to them in any other way. It's as simple as that. I hope I've made myself yes. clear. You couldn't have referred to them as spouse. Well, they were un when you talk of two persons, and what it says is they should not have had a spouse. Otherwise, they can marry. Yes. So persons in 4.1 can only meet persons who are unmarried. So to <laughs> interpolate into that the concept of spouse is wholly, wholly alien. You remember that, so I won't take you to the statute, Malaj, that's all. Yes. Then Miller's declaration of a substantive right to marry and its legal recognition. Petitioner before the court are seeking a declaration that this court confers on same-sex couples the same rights that are available to heterosexual unions. Recognition of same-sex unions can take place in two ways, either through legislation which confers recognition to same-sex and LGBTQIA unions, or through a declaration by the court holding that such unions should be recognized by law. Therefore, the court must consider the following. One, does the fundamental right to choose your partner include the right to marry dehors a legislative enactment recognizing such marriage? Two, if the answer is in the affirmative, then is the state obliged to legislate and recognize same-sex marriages and accordingly confer the same attendant benefits that heterosexual marriages have? Implicit within these two assertions by the petitioners, are two assertions by the British. First, that opposite sex and same sex couples are part of the same class. Well, this is completely, completely conceptually erroneous. Therefore, there can be no discrimination between them under 14 and 15. Second, that a marriage is a union between any two persons, irrespective of their gender and sexual orientation. Hence, the right to marry under 21 includes the right to be legally recognized by the state as such. The union between heterosexual couples recognized within society, even in the absence of law, is a sociological phenomenon, the organic evolution of which has endured thousands of years in different forms. Well, it's, and I won't read it further, I'll just show this to your lordships, that what has been happening in Europe and actually in the, in the developed world over the years is there has been a breakup, an atomization of the family. 
And because of the atomization of the family, problems have arisen, Mullahs. Divorces take place, people start living with each other. And Mullahs, therefore, the need to regulate came to Europe much earlier than it has come here. The atomization of the family has started here because of the process of economic liberalization and people, people having their own um, uh, dreams to Mullahs uh, follow so to say. So it is this process that needs one recognition, two needs evaluation, and three needs reg legislation. So first recognize, then you evaluate, then you legislate. You don't have a declaration from the court saying, this is what, I, this is what we decide. So therefore, in paragraph six so here, mothers, of this part, consequently, individuals started exercising choices, such as issues of divorce, custody, maintenance, amongst others, were required to be addressed and regulated. This could only happen through the medium of law. Therefore, for the first time in 55, Parliament enacted the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955. Now, well, I heard somebody say in the Oxford Union that, you know, we are a vote bank. Tomorrow the politicians will have to run after, run after us because we too have votes. This is the dynamics of society and within society. You should allow that dynamics to play out. You have to allow that dynamics to play out. Then Miller's seven is important from our standpoint. These historical developments in the context of societal and community standards prevailing from time to time demonstrate that heterosexual and same-sex couples were not only perceived as belonging to separate classes, but that the legislature chose not to recognize and regulate heterosexual marriages as distinct from non-heterosexual unions. Therefore, the contention of the petitioners that the court declares same-sex unions and heterosexual unions as belonging to the same class is belied both by history and legislative intent. Because their argument was that this is, and your lordships also mentioned, this has been, this has been there for centuries in India. So in 1955, <laughs> when the law was enacted, parliament knew and chose not to de declare them alert. That itself gives you, that itself proves the legislative intent that we didn't want to include them here. So both historically and through legislative intent, they don't belong to the same class. They can't. So this whole argument of 14 and 15 is a non sequitur. So then I discussed NALSA, which is gender identity. I don't have to say anything more on that. I've already said what I had to say. Then, Uttu Swami, your lordships, Malas, I've quoted the paragraph. Your lordships have dealt with Nalsa in Uttu Swami. So I've quoted that paragraph. I won't trouble your lordships. Then human dignity, the aspect of human dignity and privacy, the relationship between dignity and privacy is para 13. And then Navtej Johar, which elaborates upon the concept of privacy with reference to an individual's sexual orientation which is fine. Then privacy in public spaces, para 15 is important. The choice of sexuality is at the core of privacy. Both, but equally our constitutional jurisprudence must recognize that public assertion of identity founded in sexual orientation is crucial to the exercise of freedoms. So you need to be, nobody can discriminate you if you publicly, publicly identify yourself. That also is part of privacy. Then Miller's autonomy and privacy. Autonomy and privacy, para 16, are inextricably linked. Each requires the other for its full realization. Their interrelationship has been recognized in Putra Swami. Privacy postulates the reservation of a private space for the individual described as the right to be left alone. The concept is founded on the autonomy of the individual. The ability of an individual to make choices lies at the core of the human personality. The notion of privacy enables the individual to assert and control the human element, which is inseparable from the personality of the individual. The inviolable nature of the human personality is manifested in the ability to make decisions on matters intimate in human life. 
The autonomy of the individual is associated over matters which can be kept private. These are concerns over which there is legitimate expectation of privacy. It has nothing to do, Malaj. See, the moment you cross the boundaries, the contours of privacy, you come into the public space. Within the contours of privacy, you have complete freedom. The moment you go beyond the contour, well, as then societal responses, debates, discussions, acceptance. Give, don't you that absolute right to be recognized? So, uh, in the absence of an interfaith marriage law, yes. What you are saying is, in the absence of an interfaith marriage law, yes, which pro regulates intercaste and interfaith, could you have gone and said that I am not enabled to so make a law? I have a right to marry. You could have you you marry, Malas. Nobody will dispute that. Who prevents you from oh. marrying? What you are asking for is not that, Malas. They are married. The problem is not that, Malaj. You can call it by any name, which is why, Malaj, it's really not necessary for your lordship to say marriage is part of 21 or 14. Marriage is, an marriage is a union of people. It's inalienable. I have a right to be together with anybody I want, maybe same sex, maybe heterosexual, maybe anything. This is the problem. It is the recognition which matters. It's not the the union which which is a given, Malaj. The heart of the issue is recognition, Malaj. Now, Malaj, paragraph nineteen at page nine. Consequently, both same-sex and opposite-sex marriages are premised on the same human needs of love. This is the argument: affection, stability, longevity, legislative. Regime is built around dynamics that are unique to heterosexual marriages. So, too, a new legislative mm -hmm. regime for same sex marriages will have to respond to the unique characteristics and challenges that same sex couples face. That's what's important, Pallas. They will face different challenges. Let us face, assume, for a moment, assume that Parliament makes a law only with reference to LGBTQIA plus unions, as it has done for the transgender community. Would such a law be liable to be struck down on the ground that there can be no separate law for same-sex unions because they belong to the same class as heterosexual? I submit that such a law, if made, can never be struck down because difficult, different procedures will have to be evolved in the unique context of same-sex unions. The consequential issues that are bound to arise when dealing with reference to such unions may not be relevant in the context of heterosexual unions. Therefore, the petitioner's contention that they are being denied equal protection of the law by virtue of them being extended, not being extended, um, excluded from the, being excluded from the SMA is liable to be rejected. The contention is based on an incorrect assumption. Both society and the law must consider them as belonging to unions of the same class without reference to their sexual orientation. Therefore, the exclusion of six of SMA is not violative of 14. So this is on the Article 14, well, that I'm done with that.